Thank you, Tim, and Marilyn, and Jude. Good evening, church. Good, evening. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for being here. Guests, thank you for choosing to be a part of our worship tonight. Our worship tonight is a little bit different from what we normally have, but we're very excited to have a good friend to come and share about a work that God is doing in Seattle. I didn't know Andy Brown before he came and was pastor of Elliott, uh, First Baptist Church in Elliott, but he and I got to know each other a little bit while he was here, and uh, I learned that he is a man who is passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ and about the gospel uh, work and about the Great Commission. That's a great combination. Uh, that's about as good as it gets. And Andy is here tonight to share with us about what God is doing through him and his family as they plant a church uh, in Seattle. And in case he is uh, too modest and you don't know it, as you listen to him, I want you to know one thing. Planting a church is one of the most difficult jobs that anybody will ever do in this life. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. I wouldn't put it quite up there with raising children. That's probably still at the top. But planting a church is probably just right below that. It's a very, very difficult task. It requires a lot of commitment, a lot of hours, a lot of dedication. So I want you to be aware that you're uh, listening to somebody tonight who is uh, all four paws in. Come on up, Andy, and share with us. About planting a church while raising children. Does that count? Yeah. <laughs> is this where you want me at? Or? Okay. All right. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, um, I haven't scanned the crowd yet, but I've met many of you, and um, it's just been great to be back in the South. I'll tell you a couple of things that being in the Northwest um, has, uh, I've just been reminded of, of how fortunate I was when I was here. A couple of things is fried fish, fried catfish. Um, in the Northwest, we have this thing called cod. That's what they serve at Long John Silver's. It is pales in comparison to catfish. You people don't know how blessed you are to have fried catfish at your fingertips. I've had it twice since being here Friday night. Probably will have it a third time before I leave. Uh, sweet tea. We don't have sweet tea anywhere. You go to a restaurant, you order sweet tea, they look at you and they're like, what is that? There's some sugar on the table. It's not the same. It's just not the same. And then I'll tell you the other thing, too. Uh, I've been here four days and not one person has asked me about my accent. Not a person. Every day, at least two or three times in the Northwest, somebody says, you're not from around here, are you? I live in Kenmore. I've been here, you know, live in Kenmore. I'm a resident. Yeah, well, you sound funny. No, I've sounded like this always. You sound funny. And uh, so, you know, it's been nice just to come down and see friendly faces and, and eat good fish and, and those kind of things. But, you know, I'm a lot. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I got to speak at Collindale First Baptist this morning. We had a great time. God showed up. It was awesome. Pray that he does the same here tonight. In fact, we know he's here. So are we ready to hear from him? And so um, I pray that that will happen and take place. And, you know, it's my extreme pleasure to, to be here. Richard, thank you for this opportunity. Um, church, you may not know this, but when I was pastor at Elliott, uh, we were there about 22 months. And, uh, you know, pastors have good days and bad days. And I had some bad days in there. And uh, Richard was, was the guy. Uh, you know, he was the guy that I would talk to uh, that always gave sound advice. Uh, he didn't make fun of me for crying. I'm a grown man. And uh, I just really uh, love him uh, and his ability to give wisdom. Uh, I got back, I got him back one day, though. Uh, we were at an Arkansas Baptist State Convention meeting, and we were sitting there, and it's one of those just super boring meetings. You're like, why are we here? You know, could we sing and preach or something? But just, I hate business meetings, I think. And uh, it's kind of one of those deals where they were electing officers, and it was one of those deals where we need somebody to nominate somebody. And we sat there a good 10 minutes, and nobody was going to say anything. I said, well, I'm ready to eat. So I'm going to the front, and I thought the first name was Richard Foster. I said, I nominated Richard Foster for this position. I didn't know what I was nominating him for. But uh, they said, why are you nominating him? I said, well, he's been a great influence in my life. I'm sure he'd be good for the state. So there you go. I hope that was a good time serving with those guys. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know if you ever knew I did that or not, but it was me. Uh, so... Uh, you know, I, I put your pastor to work, so y'all can thank me for that later. But again, I, I'm grateful to be here. I hope to have fun with you tonight. I hope that, um, you know, you will have your, your eyes and your heart uh, opened up to a reality that probably most of you didn't come in here knowing today about uh, cities in North America. And um, uh, just to keep things uh, kind of in order uh, based on the PowerPoint stuff, I'm going to go ahead and show you a video. And what this is, this is a video, uh, and I'll come back and recap some of the stuff you see. 
but it's, uh, it's about four minutes long, and you're going to see the evolution of a church that it was me and my wife and three kids moved up in uh, January of 2013, and uh, we'll talk about some numbers and things like that, and I've got a message at the end, but just watch the evolution of the church for nothing, I want you to see this, and we'll talk about it in a second. I don't know much of the story you saw in the video there without knowing anything previously, but some of those stats I hope stood out to you. We'll cover those in just a second. But uh, just to clarify, I know you all were like, well, you, you looked like you were in a, a government building and then a church and then now a senior center. It kind of kind of tell you the life of the church plan is you meet wherever you can go and afford to meet and, and tell people about Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're now in our, uh, I think, third or fourth location. We've signed a year lease in the senior center. Uh, my day starts every Sunday at 4.30 in the morning as I get up and, and pray and, and get ready. We're out the door at 6 a.m. and we have to set up uh, our entire uh, equipment, uh, screens, sound equipment, children's area. Uh, everything is completely, uh, we transform the building on Sundays, but praise God, a lot more than a building's being transformed. Lives are being changed. And um, so um, I want to tell you, there's a verse that, that I want to show up. It was in my quiet time the other day. And, um, some of those stats before I share those with you. It's out of Proverbs chapter 25, verse 25. And, and the verse just simply says, like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a distant land. And, and that's what I have the privilege of bringing tonight is good news from a distant land. And, and so I can break that down for you. I want to show you some of the stats that, that you saw maybe quickly on the video. And, and I hope what those will do is, is they'll break your heart. I'm going to kind of tell my story about how God moved us there uh, as a result of knowing these numbers. But uh, you may have saw there that some alarming statistics about Seattle. Four and a half million people, 96% unchurched. Now, I don't, I don't know. Let me put that into context for you, okay? The uh, state of Arkansas is a little less than three million people. We have four and a half million people in our metro area. Um, it is 96% on church. What that means is on any given Sunday like today, uh, around 180,000 people out of 4.5 million visited an evangelical church. That doesn't mean they're born again. That means they were in a church. So on any given Sunday, 4% of the population is in an evangelical church. What's scarier than that is I've been to many of these evangelical churches. They are not evangelical churches. They are uh, churches that have, uh, we have multiple churches, uh, First Baptist churches, they're not SBC, but multiple churches who have uh, homosexual pastors, not members, homosexual pastors. Uh, we have multiple churches, uh, Lutheran, uh, Methodist, who will put on their billboard, uh, marquee as a way of inviting people in, we support gay marriage. Um, it is the way they grow their church. And so when you go in and you hear the Bible being taught, uh, number one, um, it's, it's not there. So it, you, know, you can't say the Bible is being taught. It's missing from many services. And so what you have is a very liberal area, one of the most liberal in the U.S., uh, which has filtered its way into the churches. And so I don't know if that number alarms you, but to me, 4% evangelical uh, church, that's scary. How many of you knew that? Did you know that about cities in North America that you had places that were 95% or greater unchurched? Did you know that, anybody? I didn't. I mean, I'm minding my business pastoring Elliott Baptist Church in 2012. Um, blessed to have some of those folks here tonight, and I, I love them dearly. I, I still love that church. Uh, as my first senior pastor, um, I had to be honest to say I really knew nothing about missions uh, nationally or internationally. I just love people and his Richard said, uh, I'm very committed to the gospel. Uh, I'm very committed to sharing uh, about Jesus Christ and life transforming power. And, and my heart was camping. It, it was. And God was blessing and moving and we had went through some challenging times, but God was beginning to show favor on our church. And man, we were, we were averaging 130 there. Uh, the last six months I was there, we were really clicking along and I um, believe we baptized about 12 the last six months. There was no reason to leave. There's great cooks at Elliott Baptist Church. I mean, I put on a lot of weight, which is very obvious in a skinny guy. I mean, I can't hide it because it all goes right here. And uh, I, there's no reason to leave. And in fact, other churches in Arkansas are beginning to call and say, hey, uh, we, we would like you to pray about becoming our pastor. And I said, no, I, I really like where I'm at. And uh, I had a good neighbor, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, no, we, we, we remind our business. I go to Seattle to do a wedding for a friend, 
And uh, about midway through the trip, I start realizing um, just after person after person at this, this week long getting ready for this wedding would say, hey, you're not what I expected. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're the first pastor I've ever met, and um, I just you're different than what I expected. And I said, well, what do you mean I'm the first pastor you've ever met? He said, well, I've never been to church. And I heard that over and over and over again. And coming from a church culture, I mean, you can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm, I'm born and bred right here. This is my hometown. You know, in this area, Haines, Louisiana, and all over Arkansas. And so for me to go to a place where they've never been to church is just odd. And I know people that don't go to church here, but they've been to church. And, and so I start just, I challenge you to do this. Go, go online tonight and Google uh, you know, religion in Seattle or Christianity in Seattle. And you're going to find a bunch of things that verify what I say. I'm not sharing anything tonight uh, out of context. I'm not hyping it up so you'll feel uh, something more than you should. This is the truth. The truth is that 96% of the people don't go to an evangelical church. Never have. Uh, you know, it, we talk about revival in the Bible Belt. We talk about, you know, uh, you know, Lord, bring us back to you kind of stuff. This is a post-Christian area. Seattle in the Northwest is a pre-Christian area. There's never been a strong Christian uh, presence there. Uh, it, it is truly uh, the devil has his stronghold on this place. Uh, another stat I want to share for you that is alarming. Um, good Southern Baptist. We love to see Southern Baptist work going around. There's only one Southern Baptist church for every 28,560 people. Now, uh, Camden, 12, 13,000. Something like that. Double it. Add a couple thousand for good measure. How many Southern Baptist churches do we have in Camden, which is half the size and then some of, uh, of, of well, 28,560 people? You got Southern Baptist churches everywhere. And if they're not Southern Baptist churches, they're at least evangelical churches that are true to the gospel. We have one Southern Baptist church for 28,560 people. My immediate context in a three-mile radius of of my church, there's 100,000 people in a three-mile radius. I mean, Seattle's just packed in. So you got city to city to city, and they're all right there together. 100,000 people. Uh, I am one of only two uh, English-speaking Southern Baptist churches for 100,000 people. The other church runs about 150 people. They've been going for 30 years. There's a lot of lost people that are not hearing a conservative biblical message calling people to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus Christ. It's just not happening. And, and I'll tell you another statistic that I found to be uh, alarming. And, uh, you know, I, I don't make a habit of ranking sins. I don't do that. I think that's been one of the greatest sins of the church is that we tend to rank everybody's sins. Usually their sins are worse than our sins kind of deal. Um, but the Bible is true. Uh, it's clear homosexuality is a sin. It absolutely is. Uh, in, in Seattle, the metro, uh, Seattle metro gay population is 6.5% of the population compared to only 4% evangelical church population. Almost double. Let's break that down in numbers so you can understand that. Th and these were numbers were from 2006. This is the latest research, so you know the gay population has increased. Uh, if you weren't aware, uh, Seattle legalized gay marriage this last year while we were there, uh, as is now legalized marijuana. Uh, you cannot walk down the streets of our city without smelling uh, marijuana all around you. It's, it's very evident openly practice. The police don't even say anything about it. Uh, but the very first night that uh, gay marriage was passed in King County alone, not all of Seattle, just King County alone, uh, over 1,900 gay marriage licenses were issued. One county, one night. That's 300,000 homosexuals. 180,000 in an evangelical church today. The word that God used to stir our hearts to leave Elliot, which was a hard thing to do, the word that God just kept pounding on my heart and chest was this, unacceptable. It is unacceptable that in North America, with the gospel so readily available to people, Bible so readily available to people, it is unacceptable that a place like that exists in our own land. And, and, and what I want you to understand from tonight is this, that, you know, our response as a church typically has been criticism and anger and disgust and pointing the finger when that's not God's plan at all. God's plan was to, as you go, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These cities are in the condition they're in because of the lack of, of our efforts to take the gospel to them. A very simple saying, the lost people do what lost people do, they sin. 
Have we forgotten that one day we were apart from Christ and we were in sin ourselves? Have we forgotten what it's like? We should be remembered right now because all of us still sin every day now. May not mean to, may not want to, but our flesh gets the best of us. Amen? We're sinners. You know what separates us from, from hell? Some shed blood of a, a perfect Savior. And we needed someone to step in and tell us and, and, and continue to love us and invest in us even though we weren't worthy so that one day we'd finally come to faith in Christ. These cities have never had that. And so to point the finger and criticize when we've not done our part to take the gospel to them, which is what Christ commanded, I feel like it's our failure, not theirs. It's our fault. That's why we love what we get to do. And so I talked about good news from a distant land. And let me share some of those things because if we end the sermon right now, it would be pretty depressing, you know. Uh, man, I mean, this is a lost city. And, and I do want to comment on this about how it affects you here today. Having been on both sides of the fence, I can confidently say this. That, um, uh, you know, 84% of the U.S. population is found in the, in the metropolitan cities. 84% of the entire U.S. population is found in Boston, Las Vegas, New York, Seattle, San Diego. And that's where our people live in the cities. I remember watching the elections and going, you know, blue-red, which states which. And I remember going, you know, well, man, why are those people voting that way? Why are they voting for liberal values? And I would criticize and say, well, their values don't match up with the Bible. And you know what? It's not their fault. I meet people every day who don't own a Bible. We have Bibles out all the time, and we see people uh, actually cry after we pray with them. We, we've done this many times with homeless people where we will go and we'll buy them food. We don't give them food. We take them to lunch. We listen to their story. Your mission team, if you come up, this is what we'll do. We'll go. We'll split you up into groups of two or three. You will take someone homeless to lunch. You will sit with them. You will hear their story. They will tell you how they got there. You will take them back. You will give them a bag with deodorant, soap, and a Bible. And you will say, hey, listen, I want to pray for you. How can I pray for you? And, and, and also, because I'm a missionary from Arkansas, and I don't know how to minister and, and really love people like you, and I want to learn how. I don't care if you believe in God or not, but you pray for me. And so we pray for homeless people. We ask them to pray for us. And you know what people we hear all the time? Thank you. I've never had a Bible. And through tears, they'll say, I've never prayed in my life. It's not their fault if they don't know. And, and so we've got to stop criticizing and we've got to say, look, your life is affected here in South Arkansas because the laws that are passed in this land, they're not passed by you and I. We're, we're too small to make a difference. They're passed in cities, North American cities that are lost. And so I feel like if you want your grandchildren and your children to have a better life, then we better get busy about the Lord's work and win these, these cities to Christ. Good news from a distant land is this, that from a tribe of five, that's what I called me and my family. It was us, man. That was it. It was me and my wife and three kids. And uh, the three little ones, I think they're going to be evangelistic machines, but right now they're not. You know, Jordan, Jordan's struggling with this idea of the Trinity right now. He just doesn't get his mind around it. He's six, and, you know, he thinks he's got it figured out. But, man, I'm 35, and I still don't know if i got it figured out. I'm just kidding. But, you know, he's doing the best he can, but he... You know, it was just the, the, my wife and I moved out with three kids and the tribe of five to one year later we launched with a church of 37 people. And so we'll, the way that worked is we moved there in January of 2013. We spent a year just, just plowing the ground, uh, trying to get mission teams to come up, which Calvary, I was glad to see some folks from Calvary here. The very first team that came up was from East Camden, Calvary's church, and Neil Wigley from over here at Hillside came up. And, and we didn't know what we were doing, but we said, look, we love Jesus, we're going to love, we're going to serve people. We went out and we found ourselves doing landscaping at the school. And we just tried to show the love of Christ in action. And we were not allowed, nor were we allowed to today, to talk about God. Jesus, Bible, church can't mention those things in a liberal land. And, and it's very rare for a church to get onto a school campus. You've got to understand that. This is not, uh, this is an area that's hostile to the gospel. We really are. We have a, Seattle has a gay mayor. I mean, there is a very liberal, liberal place. And so for us as a church, to be on a school campus is a big, big deal. And so there are guidelines we've got to follow. But, but what's happened is, is we went in and we've served, and, um, and through our servant evangelism, we've built relationships and we've earned respect throughout the city, and we've earned the right to share the gospel. That may sound odd to you, but we have earned the right and the respect to share the gospel. If we lead with the gospel, I promise you, all we see is a brick wall. These people are already hardened to the gospel. They are anti-church. They are anti-God. It is the closest thing to international missions on North American soil that you can find. And so we have to lead with love. 
And so the, the title of my message tonight is a simple principle that we go by. It's called Taking Jesus to the Streets. We can't invite people to a building. Number one, we don't have a building. So uh, we can't invite people to a building. So we simply say, look, we're going to take the love of Jesus to the streets. And we're going to show him, we're going to show people in tangible ways the way that Jesus loves them. And as we gain their trust and respect, we will share the gospel. We're unbending. Don't, don't hear me wrong tonight. We're unbending, undying, totally surrendered to the gospel. And, but we have to earn the respect to share it. And, and so we, uh, we did a lot of missions work last year. We did monthly preview services. And we launched weekly services this January. 37 people in attendance. Now, I want you to hear, um, since March 1, though, since March the 1st, we have been seeing God do uh, some mir miraculous things. Uh, the, the church has more than doubled in size. We have grown from a church of about 40 to 45 to now a church of 65 to, to 80 or 85 or so. And the way that works out, the way we count that is this. Uh, for you to be considered a part of our core, you have to come at least two Sundays a month. We're not counting people that come once a month. Uh, we have somewhere between 60 and 65 people that come at least two Sundays a month. Uh, and, and that's a big deal for Seattle. you got to understand, you don't come from a church culture. If you go from not going to church ever to going twice a month, that's a big deal. It's a big commitment in their minds. And the average churchgoer in Seattle only goes 56% of the time. So we feel pretty blessed that we've got 60 plus names that are coming uh, after one year and only four months of weekly services. Uh, God doubled the church in the last two months is just phenomenal. It's just been amazing. And so we're very, very, very blessed. We're now averaging about 45 people on Sundays. Uh, the whole month of, of May, uh, April, uh, we had uh, 43, 46, 48, and 45 uh, in services. So God is, is moving there. But, you know, numbers are, are great. i got one more stat I want to share with you. The last nine weeks, we've had 66 first-time guests. 66 first-time visitors in the last nine weeks. But, but here's, the, here's the one I'm really pumped about. We've had eight professions of faith. Eight salvations. And here, here's the great thing about that. Is you know, 17 recommitments to Christ and four baptisms. People in Seattle are generationally isolationist. I was, we were laughing, Richard and I were laughing in the office. I think I caught him off guard. He caught me off guard at first too. But Seattle is really not that old of a city. And the way it was formed, you had lumberjacks, uh, prostitutes, and gold miners who fled west that wanted to get away from religious and political uh, opposition, and, and, and they just fled out there as far as you can go in the continental U.S. without a passport. And so they went to settle this area, and it was just a big, a big party place. Um, again, not, not overemphasizing homosexuality, uh, sin is sin, uh, but in, uh, you know, everybody talks about uh, San Francisco and all those things. Uh, homosexuality has been openly practiced in uh, Capitol Hill right off downtown Seattle for over 110 years. Openly practiced. There is an annual uh, gay day bike parade where everybody's naked ride their bikes down the middle of town. And everybody celebrates. The kids, moms, everybody. It's a big deal. We don't go. I haven't ventured over there yet. No plan to. But, you know, I just want you to see that this is a different area. And so to see people stepping out and stepping away from sin and saying, you know what, I will confess my sin because I, I hear the gospel. I hear that there's a God who loves me. That in spite of my weaknesses and my failures and my faults against Him, that, that if, I'll, if the gospel is true, that all I've got to do is, con is confess my sin and say, God, I'm sorry, and repent of my sin and say, I don't want to live like that anymore. And Jesus, I believe that You are God in the flesh. You died on, my, on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. And, and that I can become someone new. People are responding to that. And that's the good news that I bring you is, is there's hope. And, and it shouldn't be shocking to us. Sometimes I'm in awe of what God is doing, but the reality is, it is, is God has not lost His power that we see in Acts. What has been lost is our commitment to share the gospel and to trust in the saving power of Jesus Christ. And so shame on me for being amazed that eight people have given their life to Christ. I can't wait to come back and report that it's numbers that we can't count anymore. If you remember in Acts, it says that so-and-so were added to the church and added to the church, and finally it said multiply. And I can't wait to see multiplication taking place. 
why we do what we do, but 17 recommitments to Christ. Guys, this is not people coming down and saying, okay, God, I'll finally quit smoking. That's not a recommitment to Christ. These are folks that are coming down and saying, look, I'm tired of living a life of sin. I gave my life to Jesus as a, you know, back in the day, but I tell you what, today I'm ready to live for Jesus. We're seeing people through tears radically transformed. And, and uh, just today, uh, I had a guest speaker, a friend of mine who's a church planner, he taught on uh, the Lord's Supper. Just to let you see how God is moving and how these guests are being assimilated into our church. We, like I said, we've doubled in the last few months. Um, just so happened we were finishing a series today, and uh, he was teaching on the Lord's Supper. Our church first took the Lord's Supper for the first time about two months ago. And uh, so within that two months, uh, now a regular attender has came, and they told uh, Warren, my buddy today after the Lord's Supper, he taught him and observed it. He said, that was the first time in my life I've observed the Lord's Supper. I mean, it's a different context, guys. I can't take out the Bible and say, hey, turn to the Gospel of Mark. I have to say, turn to page 645. You know? They don't know who Moses is. They have no clue who Noah is. They just don't know. Now, not everybody is like that, but I'm telling you, we meet people like that all the time. Another statistic I want to share with you before I really get into a little bit about who we are as a church, and then we'll finish with a challenge that God is using His Word to challenge us. National average for atheists, I want you to listen to this number. This is scary. National average for atheism in the United States of America is growing right now. It's somewhere between 5 and 8% nationally. Okay? Seattle's the number one city in the U.S. for atheism. Uh, we are 25% atheist. One in four hundred people here tonight, 25 of you would be atheist. Does that scare you a little bit? These are the people that are teaching our kids. These are the doctors that we go see. These are the dentists, the bankers. These are the ones in the universities. These are the guys that you see the movies being made about that are the angry biology teachers who will yell at you and tell you there is no God. I will flunk you if you say there's a God. That's the world we live in. And what happens in the cities uh, in the north will eventually make its way to the south. If you don't believe that, then just keep on not sharing the gospel. final thing that's good news from a distant land is this, that every single day myself and others who've given their life to Christ, we get to have gospel conversations every single day with people who are spiritually searching, who are caught in all kinds of sins, who come from all kinds of backgrounds. It is uh, truly amazing the conversations that we get to have on a daily basis. I'll tell you real quick our brief five-year vision to tell you why we have this. I, uh, I would joke and tell you that it's a dangerous thing when you get along with God and say, God, show me what you want to do instead of what I can do in my own power. Uh, I went away for a weekend trip and had some statistics, some demographics in, in my pocket that I knew I needed to be aware of. And I asked God to show me where you want this church to go because as Richard said, church planning is very tough. I've had some, some difficult jobs in my life. This has been far, by far the, the hardest. It's been the most rewarding, but it's been the hardest. And, um, and so doing one church is hard enough. But I began to look at our demographics, and there are 100,000 people within a three-mile radius of my church, okay, of, of where we live. 79% Caucasian, 11% Asian, 7% Hispanic. Now, because of the illegal immigrants we have, those numbers are way wrong. You can go into my son's school, which we're there all the time, and immediately you realize that there are not that many English-speaking kids in the school. English is second language for most of them. And so those numbers are more like 65% Caucasian, about 20% Asian and probably 15 to 20% Hispanic. I don't speak Spanish. I know some dirty words in Spanish from a long time ago I shouldn't say and I don't say, so I'm no good to someone who's lost who speaks Spanish. I just can't do it. Uh, I don't know anything in Asian, not a clue. I mean, I can't even count, you know. So there's no way I can win these people to Christ. So I start going, God, I have a burden for these people. What are we going to do? And this is the vision he gave me. Six churches in five years meeting in two locations. God wants us to plant six churches meeting in two locations within a five-year period. It's unheard of. It's preposterous. It can't be done. No one talks like this. Well, what I'm learning, guys, is that when we get serious about the gospel, and we, we are burdened for people the way that God is, then we begin to follow Him at all costs and say, whatever your will is, God will seek to do it. Just don't let me mess it up. And so what we're praying to do is that in one location... We would hire a bilingual 
part-time uh, Hispanic pastor and a bilingual part-time uh, Asian-speaking pastor. We couldn't care which one because they're all up there. We've got Asian, we've got Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, and just, they're all around us. Whatever God you want us to reach, and we want to we want to take our equipment, we want to take our vision, our core values, and we want to take everything that God has given us and hand it to someone who has a burden for their people group, and we want to empower them to reach them. It's the smartest way to plant a church. And, and, and as hard as it is for us to raise support, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second, about gospel partnerships and how, how that works for NAM, because there's a lot of confusion, and, and Richard gave you the blessing to just educate you a little bit on how that works. Um, you know, it's impossible for uh, ethnic works to raise money in, 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 you know, for, for their works here in the U.S. It's, it's next to impossible. So this is the best way for us to have a kingdom impact is by using the gifts and the, the resources God has given us to bless someone who's less fortunate. And so we want to plant six churches in five years in two locations. Um, we're about a year and a half in right now. This first church is off to a great start. Uh, we're, we're growing fast. Uh, God's changing lives. I'm convinced that we're going to see these two ethnic work start within the next 12 to 18 months, and then we're going to be able, be able to re reproduce that within a five-year period. So one day I'll come back and celebrate that with you, because I know right now you think I'm a crazy person, and that's fine. Uh, our mission statement, I think you need to know uh, that we're driven by Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, we want to be nothing less than a local church with global impact. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll receive power. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And um, while, uh, while this used to be my home, you're now my Samaria. And uh, while I'm yours, uh, I believe in a gospel partnership where we pray for one another, where we send people to one another, and, and we even exchange resources to help empower each other to share the gospel. And so I'm excited you guys are praying about coming up this summer, and I'm thankful for that, Travis. And, and so I'm looking forward to a real gospel partnership where we help each other carry out Acts 1-8. Um, core values, and we'll fly through those. Um, and I've got some part of the message I want to do real briefly. But our core values, again, I think you need to know who you're dealing with. You know, There's a lot of fakes, a lot of phonies out there preaching a false gospel today. I'm not, today, I'm not one of them. Very committed to the Word of God. And uh, we have a very simple four-step process. Uh, how do we take an agnostic? Um, remember the guy, the first guy you saw baptized there, short guy that was smiling, looked kind of goofy? We baptized his wife right after that. He was agnostic when we met him May 7th last year at my son's birthday. Gave his life to Christ June 8th along with his uh, then-girlfriend, living girlfriend. Uh, gave his life to Christ right there. We began immediate uh, marriage counseling. Uh, they made a vow to stop having sex outside of marriage. We got them wed. Uh, first marriage we did in the, in, the, in the church, first baptisms we did in the church. Uh, that guy is now a part-time staff member of ours. He helps with the setup every Sunday. He is the lead setup guy in our church. You will not find someone who loves Jesus more than Brian. His life has been transformed. How? And it's through this four-step process of how do we make a great commission disciple from someone who's an atheist or an agnostic today. Number one is serve, which is where you come in. I've got people in my church that have full-time jobs, just like you do, Richard. It's very hard to go out and make a, a consistent impact in a community when people are busy. I know that. And so we use mission teams to come up and help us serve consistently in the community. And so we, we feel that if we get people serving and making a difference and showing the love of Christ in action, what's going to happen is they're going to grow. They're going to grow in their relationship uh, with God. They're going to grow in their relationship with His people. Is I believe the love of Christ is infectious, man. I pray that a half of uh, of the passion that I have for lost people uh, would, would spill over into this place today. You guys would go out and capture Camden, man. I, I pray that. This is, again, this is my hometown. Uh, I love I love this area. And so I just pray that together, you know, as we grow uh, in our relationship with the Lord, we grow in our relationship with the church, that, that people would begin to give. And that's what we start seeing in our church. As these people are far from God, they serve, they grow, they start giving sacrificially of their time, talents, and resources to advance the gospel. We're seeing people do that. You would be amazed to hear that our church talks about sending mission teams down here to you. You're our Samaria. I, I don't care that you're the Bible Belt. I'm burdened for this place. And so many people from Arkansas and Louisiana have come up and helped them serve. They now say, we want to go there and help you serve. These are people who have an unchurched background. So they're great commission disciples in the process. Finally, we want them to go. They're going to be someone who is a sold-out Great Commission disciple. If God says move to Africa, they'll go. We make no bones about it. You're going to follow Christ. You can go where He says go. And, and that's one thing I really enjoy about working with unchurched people is they don't know any better. 
I can say, look, don't argue with me. The Bible says it. And they go, okay. <laughs> you know? It's just hilarious, you know. I, 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 you know, no offense to folks at Elliot, but I poured my heart out for 22 months, and sometimes I couldn't get anybody to help me do things, you know. And I go up there, and they just go, well, man, you know, the Bible says it, we'll do it. I love that about missions in North America. We are, you know, we have all the resources, all the people, good godly people sitting in the churches in the South, and, and we struggle to, to sometimes do things. And I know Grace is one of the best churches out there as far as missions, and and I'm blessed to have partnerships with some like Calvary. There's a lot of churches in the Bible Belt that don't do anything. Don't do anything. They give money to the cooperative program. They think they've done the Great Commission. Guys, that's not it. And so I, I just pray that tonight as we kind of transition, I want to talk to you real quick about the necessity of, of gospel partnerships for guys like me. And I'm not going to pitch that you would partner with us. I'm not going to do that. But I do want you to understand what North American missionaries face. Because I think that we give the cooperative program, I, I did, before I got involved in this, I thought, well, surely, you know, North American missionaries are taking care of it. Now, I want to tell you the difference between us and international missions. An IMB missionary is fully funded. They don't raise support. They have medical coverage. They have a housing allowance. They have a car allowance. They go to their designated mission field, and they are released to work on the gospel. That's what they do. They don't have to focus on things like this, partner trips. Well, what North American Mission Board does for a guy like me is they will give you $2,000 a month the first year. I'm grateful. I'm not complaining. Please, please don't, don't hear that tonight. I'm grateful for what they do. But it's simply not enough. $2,000 a month the first year, so $24,000 the, the first year, uh, $1,400 a month the second year, and then $800 a month the third year, and then they're done. After three years, you receive no support. It's a decreasing scale. And I want to tell you right now, you can't plant a church for $24,000. Uh, in Camden, Arkansas. You can't do it. You can't support your family. You can't buy Bibles. You can't rent a building. You can't buy any equipment. You cannot plan a church on $24,000. You can't do it. You definitely can't do it in Seattle where the cost of living is 35% higher. We have a great price on rent in our house. In our block, houses go from $2,300 to $2,700 a month for rent. We got a house for $2,000. It's not a big house. It's an average house. So, you know, anything above what NAM gives us uh, through the cooperative program, we have to raise in support from families, individuals, churches, associations, businesses, anybody that will feel compelled to give, uh, we have to build a relationship with them. They don't say have to, we get to. It's a two-way relationship and partnership. And so we've been very blessed to be able to do what we do. And currently we're full-time, and uh, but it's a struggle. It really is. And so I thought you should be aware uh, that as you give to the cooperative program, uh, I want to thank you for that. I'm a direct recipient of that. Uh, Annie Armstrong, we see some of those funds. But I also want to challenge you to pray about an area of the U.S. and, 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 and you know and, and where God might have you go and, and pray and send people and you know eventually maybe partner with those folks. Missionaries need you. This country needs you. God, God needs people to be faithful. And so I want you to understand about gospel partnerships. I'm going to transition real quick and I'm going to make this very simple and, and sweet little pointed message. I want you to just get a taste of our heartbeat. And, 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 and it's not for any other reason than this that I want to see the church come alive. Amen? Anybody want to see that? Do you want to see the nation changed? Do you want to turn on the news and stop seeing all the things that we see and, and stop seeing uh, people that are dead in their sins walking around and making mistake after mistake after mistake? I don't know about you, but I want to see an awakening in this land. And, and I think that for far too long that we as churches have done things the wrong way. I think we have to look in the mirror and say, you know what? We've just been dead wrong. All along we've had the mission. We've had the gifts. We've had the Holy Spirit in us empowering us. And we have just simply failed to be obedient. And our nation is in the result that it's in. I want to take you to Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 45. I'm going to read this passage real quick. Very familiar to you guys. Uh, I can actually say that for a change in the church. I don't have to explain what the leather is and all that stuff. I can just preach and go on and we'll go eat some dinner, um, which is nice. So Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 45, we encounter Jesus and the leper. Make a quick point and then we're going to be done. And Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 45 says this, And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. This man had faith. Okay? Moved with compassion. 
If you underline or highlight in your Bible, I would encourage you to write that. That is Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The Bible clearly says He was moved with compassion. In fact, why don't you say that with me? Moved with compassion. Okay? Not just felt compassion. It moved him to do something. It moved him into action. Okay? Moved with compassion. Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sternly warned him and immediately sent him away and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing what Moses has commanded as a testimony to them. But the leper went out and began to claim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in the populated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. Now, I want you to remember that a leper was, was unclean. They had to walk and say unclean, unclean. They had to keep their distance. This was very humiliating. And for someone to touch a leper was unheard of, especially someone uh, uh, of Jesus' stature. He just didn't do it. But yet, moved with compassion, Jesus touches this man. And here's what I want you to see. We talk every week at our church about a transforming principle. I give our folks one main idea that they can chew on because if I give them three points in a poem, they get lost. I give them one point, I say, go put this into practice. And they do it. And it's changing lives. So I want to tell you the transforming principle that, that I think this passage says, and that is this. We are to take the love and compassion of Jesus to the streets. We are to take the love and the compassion of Jesus to the streets. For far too long, I don't know why we ever tried, but for far too long, we have tried to put Jesus in a box in a church. When the Jesus we study in the Gospels never was inside of a building, He was always among the people. And it was the people you and I don't like to talk to today. It was the drunkards. It was the prostitutes. It was the tax collectors. It was the less desirables. Jesus had a heart for people. He had compassion for people. And it moved him to go out and build relationships with them and meet their needs. And this is what I see is this. That moved by his compassion, Jesus finds us at the point of our own brokenness and he makes us someone brand new. I dare you to disagree with me. Because every one of you were lost at some point. You may be lost tonight. We all have brokenness. Every one of us. I was molested as an 8-year-old child. I, had a, I, I struggled with alcohol much of my life. From 12 to 27, I was a drunk and an alcoholic there toward the end. Uh, I had my own brokenness and so did you, right? Every one of you have moments of hurt, pain, sins you've struggled with, right? Amen? Every one of us. Jesus found you at the point of your brokenness. He touched you when no one else would and he, he showed you compassion and it changed and transformed you. You became someone new. And, and here's what I want you to see is in verse 45, Jesus said, don't go tell anybody. Now I'm not advocating that we disobey Jesus ever, okay? But there was a point to why Jesus told him to be quiet. It wasn't time yet. He, he wanted to be able to freely go into the cities and carry out his ministry. And, and this leper, though, he just won't shut up. He, he, won't, he won't shut up telling people about Jesus. It says that he goes out and proclaimed it freely and the news spread around so much so that Jesus could no longer go into the cities and people from everywhere started coming to him. When's the last time people were lined up out the doors to get in Grace Baptist Church and they had to, you had to do another service because there was no room? When's the last time? We have the greatest message of all time that the God of all creation loves us and desires us in spite of who we are, wants to be in a relationship with us. That is the good news. And yet people aren't flocking in. Why? Is it because God doesn't change lives? Is it because the good news isn't good news? No, those things aren't true. And so the only thing that I can come up with is that we've stopped telling people. We've stopped living out a life. This man met Jesus. He was changed at the point of his brokenness. And he couldn't stop telling people, I was unclean, I was unclean, but now I say, Jesus, Jesus. When was the last time you talked to somebody who was lost and shared the gospel? over and over and over again because you were moved with compassion and you invested in their life until the day they finally repented of their sins and said yes to Jesus. Statistics are alarming. Most evangelical Christians never share their faith. Ever. And the word that comes to my mind over and over again that's not only true in Seattle, but it's true in Camden, is unacceptable. It's unacceptable that people are dying and going to hell and we have the only solution and we hold it to ourselves. Unacceptable. 
I love that Jesus touches this man at the point of his brokenness and he just won't shut up. I want to tell you that tonight, in our silence and in our failure to carry out the Great Commission, our nation has changed. We cannot say we are a Christian nation any longer. You can't do it and be angry. I desire it to be. It's not just going to happen. Jesus said, greater things than these you will accomplish. A greater in quantity. Or not a greater in quality, but quantity. And the reason is, He placed His Spirit in you and I, and He gave us the freedom and the authority. Read Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. All authority has been given to Him. He has released us, and we have the power to go out with His Holy Spirit behind us and empowering us to share the good news and to see lives changed. Sadly, as our world, uh, our nation has changed, our most common response has not been to go out and share the gospel and to do what's necessary to see lives change. Our most common response has been to point the finger, be critical, show anger, and resent the very ones who are lost and need Jesus. Unless you want your quality of life to continue to go the opposite way of where you once held it dear here in Camden, Arkansas, then you'd better get serious about praying Jesus will save this nation, and you better do what's necessary to win these cities of Christ. And I can stand here and honestly say that I care, I could care less if it's Seattle or Boston or New York or San Diego because they're all greatly lost. It astonishes me that we withhold the love and compassion that Jesus extended us, and yet we wonder why our nation is in the shape that it is in that it's in. You know, I want to finish by asking, you know, the question that you may be wondering, what drives all that we do at the Landing Church Seattle? Why would God bless the way that He has? And I believe it's because we've got a real compassion and a genuine love for lost people. Hate their sin. Hate my own. But I love them. I love these people. I love every homosexual friend I have. I, have, I love every atheist friend I have. I love every drug dealing friend that I, I cross in the streets. They're all my friends. I love them. Hate your sin. God loved him so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for the sins that he hated as well. How can I withhold the same love and compassion for those when he's gave me nothing less than his son? We need to take the love and compassion of Jesus to the streets. I'll read you a story real quick and I'm done. You know, uh, the labor this issue anymore. I appreciate your attention. And I just want you to see that. God is doing. I'll read you a letter real quick from an atheist friend of mine. I meet with her every Tuesday. She was my son's uh, kindergarten teacher from last year. We've been investing in her life for 18 months now. Uh, she now meets with my wife and I every Thursday for coffee during her lunch break at school. Even though we didn't leave with the gospel at her school, she saw enough in us to want to build a relationship. She is the best witness we have in our church. So she's an atheist. How does that work out? She's never been to our church. But she sends everybody who ever has a problem to me. Every one of them. Brian and Kristen, the agnostic, the couple we baptized, they were sent to us by Kim, an atheist. She loves and respects us. You're going to hear that in this letter. But we, uh, she now calls me for prayer requests, which is kind of fun, getting prayer requests from an atheist. Uh, it, it's kind of awkward. But, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago in front of another atheist teacher and a, a school teacher that now comes to our church as a result of Kim, uh, she broke down in the classroom where it's unacceptable to talk about God, religious, uh, religion, Jesus, Bible. She broke down in front of this teacher and said, how can it be possible that there is no higher power? God has got this woman's heart. She just doesn't know it yet. This is a letter she wrote recently. And then, Richard, I want you to come and challenge your people however you feel led. I pray that the gospel has been clearly presented tonight, that if you've come in here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and as Richard said, tonight will be the night of your salvation. We get to share that with people all the time. And Kim has heard the gospel many times, and I believe one day that she will say yes, and I ask you to pray with me for her. This is an email she said recently uh, after a mission team from Arkansas had just left. She said, this week a student was brought to tears after saying goodbye to a volunteer. I just explained that the volunteer had flown all the way across the country because she loved us so much and she wanted to come here and help us learn. I asked the child to explain her tears. She said, but she really doesn't know me. 
that is so nice, I don't want her to go. It's the kindergarten kid with missionaries from Arkansas in the classroom, reading, working with her, playing with her on the playground. Unheard of in a liberal land. This is what Kim goes on to say. The Landing Church Seattle shows each of us here at Kenmore that we are loved. Just like my student, I think, but he or she doesn't even know me. As an unbeliever, I keep waiting for the evangelism. I keep waiting for someone to tell me my faults, their judgments, or that I will burn in hell for my unbelieving ways because that has been my experience with Christians in the past. Day after day, group after group, all I see, hear, or feel is love. Groups of people put their own lives, their own families, and jobs on hold to come in and help the teachers and students of Kenmore Elementary. How has the landing helped Kenmore? Physically through weeding, trimming bushes, moving whole classrooms, painting, etc. In the classroom through one-on-one -on -one tutoring, reading with children, cutting, copying, laminating over and over again. Listen to this, but most memorable, and in my opinion, most importantly, by showing us unconditional love. As an atheist who meets with me and my wife every week with the Bible, talking about Jesus, talking about salvation, talking about marriage, talking about everything in life, this is a woman who was anti-church, very aggressive against the church when we first got there. The gospel is powerful to change lives. It is my extreme privilege to be a North American missionary supported by you through the cooperative program. I hope that tonight maybe the Lord has spoken to you in some way. And uh, I want to invite Richard to come and, and close out and, and challenge in our way he sees fit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? If you've heard Andy tonight to present the gospel very clearly, if you've come into this room this evening and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for you. Right there where you sit in your seat, God knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. You simply pray to Him and say, God, today's the day. I'm ready to be forgiven. I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I know that I need to be forgiven. And God, I know that I need Jesus to be my Savior, to be my Lord, to be my Master, and I give you my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. The Bible promises that when we say that prayer from our heart, when we confess from our heart that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, that we have nothing to fear even when we die because we know that we'll be with the Lord forever. If you've said that prayer for the first time tonight, when we break up here in a moment, I wish you would find me or Andy or somebody that you trust, maybe Travis, and let us know, hey, I pray to ask Jesus into my heart tonight. Do you have to tell somebody? Yes, you do. Jesus said, if we confess him before man, he'll confess us before the Father in heaven. If we don't, he won't. So it's important. It's important that you tell somebody. Maybe you prayed that prayer a long time ago, but you've never, just never told anybody. All you need to do is take that next step and confess your faith openly. It's time to do that. As I look around tonight, I see that most of us are brothers and sisters in the Lord. So you've heard the challenge tonight. You know, it's easy to be overwhelmed by the numbers. Wow, four and a half million people in one city and so few followers of Jesus. We could just give up and be overwhelmed. It would be easy to do that, wouldn't it? And here, here's a guy who's been working a little over a year and he's still just fewer than 100 people. What, what hope is there in that? What hope is there in that? But then I remember that Jesus, after three years, only had 120 people gathered together in an upper room. When the Holy Spirit showed up, he took those 120 people and thousands began to be saved. The real question is whether or not we believe that that God is still alive today and he can still do the same thing. And I believe it with all my heart. I hope you do too. Thank you, Andy, for that charge. Church, we have just got to start sharing our faith. That's all there is to it. There's no guarantee that everybody we talk to is going to be saved. They won't. Jesus said that some of the soil is hard, some of it's shallow, some of it's rocky, some of it's got weeds on it, but there's some good soil out there too. We quit too easy. We, we get some hard soil and we think, well, I can't do this. Keep going. We've got to keep pushing forward and looking for that good soil. It's out there. It's out there. Father, in Jesus' name, 
Help us. We're weak, but you're strong. The job is huge, but you're bigger. The hearts sometimes are so hard, but your Holy Spirit is more than capable. We thank you, Father, that somebody didn't give up on us. We pray, Lord, that we won't give up. We thank you for Andy and what he's doing, God. We pray that you continue to bless this work, that it will continue to multiply, that it will divide, and it will double over and over again, Father. We'll see you do a mighty work there in Seattle. We want to see you do a mighty work here in Camden, God, and in our hearts and around the world. We want to see a revival like the ones we've read about from history. We want to be alive and see that happen. We bless you, God. We praise you and we thank you. We give you our hearts as best we know how. In Jesus' name, amen.